it's weird, you know, it's like things happen in life and sometimes you have to wonder if it's serendipity, coincidence or <laughs> alignment of the stars. Hard to believe sometimes the greater forces aren't at work, but then it's all a selection bias, you know, survivor bias and all that kind of thing. You're only privy to what you're privy. Once revealed, never concealed and all that. So two things kind of happened. It's kind of really weird coincidences. So the first one was, as recommended a book about a month ago, uh, Ant Middleton's The Be uh, Fear Bubbles, or The Bubbles of Fear. The fear Bubble, yeah. And I kind of sat on it for a while. I knew of Ant Middleton from things he's done on television. I've never watched the shows. I just know he was some former SAS chap who uh, went to Civic Street and um, gained a bit of a following, a bit of a no notoriety, both for his programs and for his life advices. And it turns out I've recently discovered he does his mind muscle uh, program, uh, seminar, circuit, whatever it is. I haven't looked into it. I, I don't know. Uh, sometime later, uh, another friend recommended that I tune into uh, some life coach, um, particularly struggling myself at the moment with motivation. What's it all for? You know, for those that know, I used to do a bit of the NLP. I got trained up to trainers training and I did a few interventions myself and a little bit of coaching here and there. Uh, it seemed to have spectacular results, no doubt. Um, but it just wasn't, I didn't find it satisfying just getting mired in other people's lives it just seemed horrible and one of the things they teach you in NLP is to go content free and I've seen a lot of people um, say that they're doing NLP but what they're really doing is imposition of will assumptions judgments uh, motivation by guilt motivation by shaming this is not NLP this is just um, I think I know better than you do how to run your life therefore you ought to do what I say and I'll use any mechanism to trick fuck you into doing what I think you ought to do. That is not um, at all in line with what I've come to understand as the kind of uh, intent of neuro-linguistic programming, which is to say someone has, say, a blockage in life and we will ask them questions to help them guide themselves um, to a solution suitable to their needs according to their judgment in the context of their life. It's absolutely not for us to uh, judge or impose, so hence the content free. I didn't need to know the particulars of the situation. It's enough to know you have a situation and that you want to fix it and that you're looking for new ways, new perspectives, new thoughts, new tools to be able to come to a resolution. So the idea is, it's like motivational interviewing. We ask questions and lead them to their own aha moment. So one of the tools in the many tool bags is to do a values elicitation. It's quite a clever one, and again, it extends to many other areas of life. So if you've watched, um, is it Spurlock's film, The Greatest Marketing Ever Sold? No, The Greatest Show Ever Sold, something like that. Um, it was his foray into marketing and how marketing works, and he wanted to see if he could get a sponsor for his film, and then POM sponsored it. And actually looking at the way the film's structured and how marketing works, it's a clever self-referencing self-meta commentary on the marketing of marketing and the upshot is basically boiled down to a, a kind of husk if you like values um certain companies certain corporations certain brands exude a set of values that we can identify with so when i say coca-cola what values are exemplified by coca-cola you might say fun enjoyment sharing um the world at one under one brand whatever you know that approximately might be it gillette what's the values the best a man can get certain values inherent in that virgin what values are inherent in that british airways and also look at the color of the logos you know so the, the colors are important uh, from memory you know red evokes excitement and energy orange a little bit quirky a little bit off the beaten path still a little bit of fun still a little bit of excitement but you know so like Fanta, for example, it's not red, it's orange, Virgin's red. And then, you know, we move to the other side of the spectrum, uh, luxury, indulgement, think about purples, you know, royal colours, um, blues, very reserved, conservative, look at all the financial institutions and the blue logos they have. Uh, what else have we got? Black and white. Um, these are, you know, super high-end luxury. Let's think of the logos of Mercedes, 
think of the logos of Rolls Royce. Uh, Apple now has moved from their many color logo about what ten years ago. They went to the Chrome Apple logo, black and white. And then uh, we get combinations. Think of the logo of uh, MSNBC or even Google. Many colors appeal to many people. Mass market, huge corporations. They appeal to the lot. So. Again, one of the very basic tenets of the NLP model is people like people who like themselves. So I like people who like me in this respect that they have similar values to me. They have similar political outlook, similar moralistic outlooks, and perhaps similar ways of thinking about things and similar epistemology, really, is what it's all about. Uh, I can actually get along with people that share very different opinions to mine, as long as they're honest about it. I don't like people who pretend that their right-wing fascist agenda is actually for the betterment of humanity. If we all did it, then the world would be a better place because, you know, fascism is all about equality. I just find the disingenuity horrible. I'd rather a fascist come out and say, yeah, I'm a fascist. At least then uh, there's an honesty about it. And we can have an honest dialogue and we can actually resolve to something meaningful because whilst people put up lies and red herrings and uh, rhetoric, we can't even get through to them to talk about their incoherent beliefs <laughs> in something like fascism. So yeah, recently I've just cleared out a load of Facebook friends as well who started putting up horrible rhetoric about stuff that was potentially, potentially harmful. I entered dialogue with them, pointed out factual inaccuracies, the flaw in their arguments, how it's doing harm, and actually, if you follow the logic of what they're proposing, it actually leads to the very thing that they're uh, proposing uh, to be against. So, for example, at the moment, there's these freedom rallies, you know, where people say, no, we've been locked up in our homes, it's like Nazi Germany, next thing it'll be papers, papers, papers. Well, if you look at what's happening with some of these people who do this, a lot of them, some certainly seems a section to be anti-vaxxers. When sufficient number of people don't vaccinate, we'll see the rise of measles. We'll see the rise of uh, those kind of diseases again. And horrible, horrible way to die, by the way. Now, all right, their body, their choice. But what about my kids at the same school? Or or I have a choice about uh, what's uh, safe for my kids. So what I might say is, hey, by not vaccinating your child, you're bringing risk um, into the school. Therefore, uh, you ought to be excluded until you've got a vaccine. How do we prove whether people have vaccines? Well, now we're talking about getting an app installed on a phone or some certificate, which brings about the very papers, papers, papers that these people were advocating against. And, you know, to be clear, I am against that kind of uh, requirement. I think it's uh, an awful situation where we have to go around with papers to even prove that we're fit to go to a place. But it's becoming closer and closer because lunatics like this. And perhaps I ought to just get it on the record that, um, you know, they're, they're not thinking evil enough. If I was some crazed Illuminati, new powers, world order thing with uh, delusions of reducing our population, the best way I could think to do it was to be, would be to tell people that it's safe to go out in the middle of a deadly pandemic and then to throw in for good measure, oh, you're not going to let your government tell you what to do, are you? Uh, that's the way I'd do it. And then, you know, what's rule number one in warfare? disrupt communications so perhaps we can encourage them to set fire to their own communication devices you know devices that we need uh, to call the emergency services when we're in life or death situations you have to imagine that if they really believed there was a conspiracy to do all this this is exactly how you would do it yet they are perpetuating that very agenda by participating in it the fact that they don't see it is remarkable anyway little rant over uh yeah so values uh starts with the question what's important to you in life uh, i've done this dozens of times so people will say things like truthfulness honesty uh, integrity uh, friendship love family wealth health happiness whatever it is hundreds of different values we all have and we all have a different way of putting them in order so what i normally do is i say okay what's important to you about you know, whatever area it is, life, what's important to you about work, what's important to you about family. Elicit about 15 or 20 values, really push, what else and what else and what else, right? Then you've got a list of about 15 values, whatever they are, um, truth, honesty, well-being, uh, longevity, happiness, whatever they are. And then I'll get them to rank them. Okay, you know, just if you were to put them in order, what, that, what would that look like? And then what I'd say is, okay, so 
Um, then I'd like test the hierarchy. So I'd go to the number one value and say, okay, you know, if you couldn't have that, what would be the next one that you would pick? So it kind of does like a, to use terminology, a bubble sort. So I'd start comparing the values, you know, is your value, is your top value more important or less important than the one that you put at number two? And is the one that you put at number two more or less important than the one you put at number three? So I'd check that they were in the right order. Then we've got a list of about 15 values that are in the order of importance. And then I'd just kind of work with the top 10, you know, because really not going to get down to the 15th value. It's too many. Um, and then I'd say, okay, so top value number one, let's say it's honesty. Um, why is honesty important or how is honesty important? And then I'd listen to what they say. So they might say, honesty is important because it enables me to know where I am going in life. You know, I, if people are honest with me, it's, it enables me to get on. All right. So I listen to the language then. It's a move towards language. It enables me to do something. I can achieve things knowing this and I'll, you know, I'm able to move in a particular direction in my life because of this. If they say honesty is important to me because it stops me from being conned, that's a move away from star language. So they're avoiding something. So then we now have repeat this with the other 15, uh, the other 10 values. So we now have a list of values in order and we also have a notion of what they're moving towards in life and what they're moving away from in life. And it's important to know the difference because there are a million ways of moving away from something, but perhaps only one way of getting towards a destination. So, you know, in simple terms, if we start here in geography and we don't want to go to that body of water over there, we can walk in any other direction away from that body of water. But if we want to move towards that body of water, there's only one direction to go towards the body of water. So whilst we're always moving away, we're going in any direction that is not towards something. And that is like a scattered life. It's brownie in motion. You're just moving away from the moving away from the moving away from. It's never towards anything. So then we use the techniques of NLP, you know, why are you avoiding that? What is it you're, you know, fearful of? What is it skills you don't have or uh, particular tools in your tool set or mindset or framework or an outlook that means that you're avoiding this rather than moving towards it. It comes down to fear avoidance. And we've talked about that on the channel before, you know, um, fight, flight, freeze, peas, and submit. And again, on the channel, we've also talked about perception and, and decisions. All we're doing in life is perceiving things and then making decisions based on our perception. So if our perception is always, what are we moving away from? We see everything as something to be avoided or fearful. And then the decisions will always be to move in any direction but that. But if we're perceiving something has something to move towards, then our, our actions, our energies, our focus is directed solely on a particular path. Much more likely to get there than anywhere else. So a quick note then uh, about using things like duty, obligation, um, guilt and shame to move people towards something. They're all very negative kind of uh, emotional states. You know, you have to go in this particular direction or else face shame or else face guilt or else not be honorable or else fail in your duty. So those are, I hope you can see now that they're actually negative. They move away from, you know, it's the threat of you have to do this or else, you know, reframing it, you will suffer uh, the humiliation of not being honorable if you don't do this. So in other words, you're moving away from being dishonorable. If you don't do this, then you ought to feel guilty. So we're moving away from guilt. It's not moving us towards anything. Again, it's all moving away from. So I went on this call because I'm having problems with my values. I, as I say, elicited dozens of other people's value systems. And when I write my own down, I'm just staring at a blank sheet of paper. Um, I'm told, <laughs> reading around a bit, that I probably should ask you professional advice about that. But maybe that's a story for another day. Uh, I don't know. It's just a, a desperation about life. It's, I think I've gone too far into the pits and scourge of the outskirts of insanity. I've been on social media too much. I've been reading about the awful things that people do to each other and war and, uh, crony, cronyism and, um, bent politics and killing people and moral injury. Anyway, let's move on. Yeah, so I was disappointed on this call. Uh, and the night before, I got myself into a real state. So I was thinking, oh, you know, these are the typical questions that these online coaches ask. And it really pisses me off about, 
you know, they all seem to be able to want to help the people who are already on the way that don't actually need the help. They don't seem to want to help people who are actually really in a bad situation because their advice is, well, you know, if you can't help yourself, how do you expect me to help you? Well, that's what the fucking coach is there for. I, I, I mean, again, also I think as well that a lot of coaches don't understand the difference between uh, a teacher, a mentor, a guide, a coach, and some kind of, you know, for lack of a better word, a spiritual awakener. Um, different styles of interaction. I mean, like a teacher uh, uses a style of management uh, called management by exception. You get a gold star for doing something good, you get a kick on the ass for doing something bad. Because when we're, you know, teaching young kids about sticking um, conductors into the sockets and walls and playing with sharp knives, we might not, Really, when we might not want to spend the time to educate them on what electricity is and how it's dangerous and how, because they won't understand if they're three years old, electricity is an invisible thing that can kill you. Just, it, there's no dots to connect. So we don't do that again. Coaching on your hands a bit different. Mentoring is a different thing altogether. Uh, and then, you know, this thing beyond mentoring, you know, when people are there, they've done it all, you get bored. This kind of inner spiritual thing, for lack of a better word, keeps, Competent, bored, power, busy. <laughs> it gives them something global to go after to do, you know, not just individual achievement, but how now can I ignite and uh, get a whole community going, not just me. Philanthropy, if you want to call it that, maybe. Yeah, so I was disappointed on this call because it was always about, you know, and so, yeah, I was really getting knocked in my mind the night before. What if they asked this? You know, another classic one is that, you, you know, I haven't got any money to pay for a coach. Well, that's exactly why you need to go into debt and finance paying me so that you can get some money. It's no better than the tithing of some churches. You know, you need to tithe 10% of your income to the church so that we can contact God for you. I was so disappointed when the call came. It was just nothing. It was just... They did mention values, but in a really weird way and then they said you know if you can't think of it in terms of honoring yourself then you ought to think of it in terms of honoring god and i said oh fuck's sake i don't mind people believing in god it's but but you know the imposition here is and this is why i get a bit knocked off with like that 12-step process as well acknowledging that there's something greater than you some people you know leveraging god and then i wonder if they're not trying to proselytize off of desperate people who are looking for a process to get out of a hole and they use that as an advantage to proselytize and convert them to some kind of religious dogma so then i have to question the integrity of the process now uh and it's tainted you can't use it because it's tainted i'd rather and to say that there's some other entity or purpose greater than self also says well okay well let that agency then that's greater than me do it for me when does that ever work so i realize it always has to be self actualized self-maintained and self-motivated and this is what i'm saying my personal problem is I don't really value particularly anything and have almost no motivation about anything to do anything justice seems to be high on my values but when i really think about justice really really think about it and again if you've read rolls theory of justice you realize that there's not really any such thing anyway what happened at the end of the call is i thought you know shit you know it's cliched, but I could do better than this. And the only reason I don't is because I'm not even at a standard that I think that I would need to be to do a half decent job of coaching a group of people. I, I would need to be sharp. I need to be practiced and I need to have these processes down and be able to help people guide themselves, not impose upon them. So I'm a bit out of practice and, you know, I understand that you have to do it to get the practice to be able to do it better and you know so the first few rounds the first few customers are going to be trials i kind of get that and it also depends where people are in life as well i mean the clients that are on the call were again it's it's, it's all relative isn't it because some of the problems some of the other people were talking about were i want to lose five kilos uh, and i'm thinking wow i mean just just do it It'll take two weeks to lose five kilos what's the big deal and i and i heard this before and I get really confused and this is leading up to commentary on Ham Middleton's book I've known people that won't drive at night on the car because they have some kind of paranoia about it I met people that just won't go in a swimming pool uh, met people that just won't go on an airplane 
uh, it seems crazy <laughs> to me. Again, I use this kind of commentary. I should not use that phrase. I don't understand it. It's more accurate. It's outside, so far outside of my own reference frame that I wonder what must have happened to them that they weren't going on an airplane, they weren't going to a swimming pool, um, that they weren't uh, drive a car at night. And I, these people were close in my life and I asked them, what's the deal? And there was no significant emotional event. It's not like they knew anybody or involved in an airplane crash. It's not like they knew anybody who drowned or that they saw someone in a swimming pool in difficulty. It's not like they had a crash in a car on a motorway at night. They just wouldn't do it. They got it into their heads, whatever reason. And it reminds me of something years and years ago. I kind of forget the argument, but it boils down to basically they just don't like cabbage. And uh, the story behind that is, um, imagine a young family, mum and dad, little kids, four or five years old. One of them comes home from work, let's not use stereotypes, and says to the other, what's for dinner? And the other says, oh, we've got cabbage tonight. And then the, the person who just come home from work says, oh God, not cabbage again. Yuck, really hate it. Pulls a face. Small kid looks up, sees parent pulling face, squirming, and exclaiming that they don't like a cabbage. Now, it might be because cabbage has been served for the last four nights, and they're just fed up of it, and they pull this face, but now, you know, it's installed in their four-year-old. Four-year-old is just not going to like cabbage. That's the end of it. Not for discussion. They've just absorbed that value from mum or dad. That's what I say. You just don't like cabbage. Probably don't even know what cabbage is. Uh, so, again, it's... I can't. I I got off the call thinking, wow, you know, the night before I'd been building it all up, and it was nothing like that. I got angry about it. I'd actually lost sleep over it, thinking about it, and I'm thinking, what what's going on in my mind where I'm getting anxious and getting fearful and angry about going on a life coaching call? <laughs> Just, it's not making it better. It's making it worse. I mean, it me, obviously. So then I thought, right. Fuck it, let's get that Ant Middleton book done and have a crack, because that's been recommended as well. And it's just a repeating pattern now, and I'm starting... When people recommend me books and I read them and think, what a pile of shit that was, I have to question the motivation behind people recommending these things. I think, do they not know, or are they deliberately trying to hobble me? Well, <laughs> what's going on? And I can never work it out. There's not enough data to reach a conclusion, so I'm always left in doubt. Which, again, <sighs> frustrating. I think, do they not know? Or is this impressive to them? Or... Wow, I mean, okay, is this where they are in life? What, what's the message here? Maybe I'm reading too much into it. Maybe they're just trying to promote their friend to uh, get them a bit more money. Uh, values, what's important to them, friendship or, yeah, anyway. Yeah, friendship or authenticity. <sighs> I can never tell. All right, so let's rip into it then at the Aunt Middleton book. Now, uh, you know, I, gotta, I, I do want to hold a certain amount of respect to the copyright, so I can't just read it out. That would be a performance and clear breach of copyright, but I'll, I'll have to give some context as to what's going on in the book to make comment about it. Some of it was really good. Some of it definitely have had shared experiences, and some of it just seems crazy. And I mean... It was not a month ago, six weeks ago, that Ant Middleton actually was on his YouTubes or Instagram saying, go out there, shake hands, hug people, fuck COVID-19, whilst wobbling his head in a kind of condescending way. Uh, he, he then, a few weeks later, issued another video, that kind of half non-apology that's become popular. I'm sorry you feel offended by what I said not really an apology is it and no one's saying that they were offended by what he said what he said was just plainly wrong and he hasn't taken responsibility to say what i said was wrong he almost well what he said was something along the lines of it, it wasn't in line with what's now known as best practice which infers that what he was going on data that was best practice at the time and I don't recall any medical advice at the time ever saying go out there shake hands, hug and fuck COVID-19 no, only he said that so, responsibility authenticity, integrity what's the values that's being exercised here is it damage control or is it correcting the record anyway, we'll get into it 